let's see how, how well we do it. Good morning, everybody. Excellent, excellent. President Tarman, excellencies, distinguished guests, it is a great pleasure to be in Singapore again, and it is an honor to join you this morning at this impressive forum to take stock of how far we have come and set the course for the future. Mr. President, there is no better place to look into the future than Singapore. Yes! A place where fintech flourishes and where this festival brings the unlimited energy of fintech enthusiasts. We know fintech innovation has already been transformative and it will continue to be so, changing the world of finance and making it much more accessible to hundreds of millions of businesses and people who used to be cut off from it. And I'm proud that we, the IMF, are part of this community. And I'm so grateful that I'm invited to speak to this incredible audience. I'm following in the footsteps of my predecessor, Christine Lagarde. She was here five years ago and gave a speech encouraging policymakers to follow the winds of change and embark on a digital money voyage by exploring the use of central bank digital currencies and embracing fintech. Five years on, I'm here to provide an update on that voyage. I have four main messages. And it is first that countries did set sail. Many are investigating CBDCs and are developing regulation to guide digital money developments. Second, we have not yet reached land. There is so much more space for innovation and so much uncertainty over use cases. Third, this is not the time to turn back. The public sector should keep preparing to deploy CBDCs and related payment platforms in the future. Fourth, these platforms should be designed from the start to facilitate cross-border payments including with CBDCs. So we have left port, and we are now in high seas. This calls for courage and determination. We can learn from you, entrepreneurs, business leaders, investors, and brave policy makers. We are so impressed by your bravery to be the sailors in these open waters. Waves and winds are your inspiration. Uh, and if anything, we need to raise one more sail to pick up speed, because the world is changing faster than most imagined. Just take artificial intelligence, a key theme of this festival. Look at the number of months before various applications reached 100 million users. Average time, three years. Chat GPT, two months. Adoption of CBDCs uh, is nowhere close. But about 60% of countries are exploring them in some form today. CBDCs can replace cash 
which is costly to distribute, especially in island economies. They can offer resilience in most advanced economies, and they can improve financial inclusion where few hold bank accounts. Now, in some countries today, the case is dim. But even they should remain open to potentially deploy CBDCs tomorrow. Why? First, the benefits of CBDCs will stem from what happens in the payments environment. How many other countries will adopt CBDCs? Today, there are 11. How many there would be when we meet in this festival a year from now? To what extent will cash become obsolete? And I cannot resist this. How many of you have cash in your wallets today? Let me see. How many have cash? How many don't? How many are those that are cashless? Oh, well, here we go. <laughs> so. Uh, um, we, we have to take that into account. And we also need to think about whether private forms of money will proliferate and what would be the consequences. Libra was a wake-up call. It turned out to be a false alarm. But we know that others more compliant will come knocking on the door. And in that case, CBDCs would offer a safe and low-cost alternative. They would also offer a bridge to go between private monies and a yardstick to measure their value, just like cash today, which we can withdraw from our banks. Second, the success of CBDCs, we rely on policy discussions, and how the private sector responds. The actions many of you right here today take will matter. Country authorities wishing to introduce CBDCs may need to think a little more like entrepreneurs. Communication strategies, incentives for distribution, for integration, for adoption, they are as important as design considerations. And then we have other questions on our minds. Would you, fintech leaders and developers, spend the resources that are necessary to onboard merchants so they accept CBDCs? Will you make it easy for CBDCs to be integrated into financial services and messaging apps as well, so people can pay each other from any environment. Fair enough, it would depend on the returns on your investments, but these are questions we need to ask and answer. Third, the benefits of CBDCs will depend on how technologies evolve. Artificial intelligence, for example, could amplify some of the benefits of CBDCs, it could improve financial inclusion by providing rapid, accurate credit scoring based on various data. And it could provide personalized support to people with low financial literacy, so they are in, not left out. To be sure, we need to protect personal privacy and data security, avoid embedded biases so we don't perpetuate inequality, but aim to reduce it. Managed prudently, artificial intelligence can help. Another important potential transformation resulting from the work of many of you is the tokenization of financial assets, such as bonds issued on blockchain. This opens another door to CBDCs, potentially in wholesale form, to pay for those assets. So countries need to continue to explore CBDCs. In that spirit, I am delighted to make an announcement. Today, 
that we are launching a CBDC handbook. It is available on our website. It is intended to collect and share knowledge on CBDCs for policymakers around the world to help them sail ahead. And it is a never-ending endeavor. We will continue to build on this experience as it appears itself. To the extent CBDCs are deployed, they must be built to facilitate cross-border payments, which are at present, as we know, expensive, slow, and available to few. Again, we must start this work today so we don't have to back paddle tomorrow. Efficient cross-border payments allow for capital to get quickly to where it is needed. Small businesses can grow beyond borders. Households can receive needed funds from abroad. While we do see encouraging decline in the cost of remittances, we are way far from the develop a sustainable development goal target. So we must ensure that countries don't get stuck on the wrong side of the digital divide. We know what to do to make cross-border payments more efficient in the short term. What is the answer? Improve what we already have. And this is the spirit of the G20 roadmap to enhance cross-border payments. In fact, I am happy to announce that the IMF and the World Bank will soon publish a common plan to provide capacity development to countries in just that area. But in the medium term, new cross-border platforms may help. Think of those as next generation virtual town squares where central banks, commercial banks, and potentially even households and firms can gather to exchange CBDCs in wholesale or retail form. Such platforms can even be built to interface with traditional forms of money and manage risks from payments. And they're being explored by a wide range of players. Banks and fintech companies are at the forefront they're building infrastructure to pay each other and to exchange financial assets on common blockchain networks. And the public sector is stepping in, pushing the frontier, including with the help of BIS Innovation Hub. And here I want to cheer the Monetary Authority of Singapore. Very active, and its project Guardian that explores platforms to exchange digital money and assets. So, we are joining as an observer with the IMF, and I want to say big thank you to Ravi Menon for including us. Thank you. So, we know there are many ships sailing in these waters, and this is very good. But we may be at the point where the public sector needs to offer a little more guidance. Not to crowd, crowd out the private sector, not to disrupt, but to act as catalyst to ensure safety and efficiency and to counter fragmentation. What we need in this voyage is a compass. One way to provide a compass is to establish the desirable uh, properties of cross-border platforms from a policy standpoint. Define what is necessary. For instance, platforms must allow countries to manage capital flows and retain control over their monetary, uh, monetary policy, over their money, su money supply. Uh, equally important, we need common rules of the game so we can fight money laundering, terrorist financing, and provide data protection. Again, artificial intelligence can help. As a, a solutions known as RegTech 
could reduce cost of compliance and would be like using priority lanes in airports, skipping over the long queues of security. We don't have to decide today what is desirable, but we have to define the contours so we can support the integration and stability of the international monetary system. If we don't do that, we may actually fragment it. And of course, there is no one institution that can do that. We, the IMF, are committed to collaborate with all that matter in this field. Let me conclude with the following. We are going to be in high seas for some time, but the potential payoff is clear, a more inclusive international financial system that meets our future needs. So let us not disembark on the first island, nor turn back. There is value in the voyage itself. As Marcel Proust once said, the real voyage of discovery consists not in seeking new landscapes, but having new eyes. And that speaks of the strength of this festival, the strength of many eyes, the power to bring fresh perspective to problems and challenges, old and new. And I look forward to continuing this voyage with all of you. Let us sail together. Thank you. Can I have my, my back? I cannot resist this. I cannot. So here we are, and we will, we will rock you. Thank you.